Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to the rest of you guys. We are back for another episode of Bitcoin Magazine Live, and this is going to be our final episode ahead of the conference. And you know what that means. That means you need to buy a conference ticket using code YTMAG so I and Chris, wow, terrible grammar, but Chris and I can keep our jobs and keep bringing episodes to you guys on the other side of the conference. Uh, I'm going to say this now so you guys are aware, but we're going to be off for the next two weeks. Uh, I'm going to be on vacation. I don't really know what, what else is going on in Bitcoin land. Um, but I'm going to be on vacation down in Miami. But no, in all seriousness, uh, we have some exciting stuff coming to you guys next week. Uh, Chris and I have been doing a lot of interviews on the side. So we're going to be releasing those interviews uh, on Monday and Tuesday of next week. So you'll have some new interview content. And then the conference kicks off Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And each of those days, we're going to be streaming the conference for you guys. Uh, and we have a fun little news desk set up. Uh, I'll make a little appearance, but there'll be some bigger, more important names on that news desk that you're not going to want to miss. Uh, all of the big announcements that we have been talking about teasing this whole time, um, you're going to hear them first from the Bitcoin Magazine YouTube channel. So be sure you press that subscribe button right down there. Make sure you subscribe so you stay up to date with all those announcements coming to you guys live from the conference. And then the week after the conference, we are actually not going to be releasing any new Bitcoin Magazine live episodes. We are instead going to be focusing and working on bringing out all of the other content from the conference that isn't going to be streamed live. So next week, you're going to see everything from the main stage. You can see a lot of commentary from big heavy hitter names. I'll tease a few for you right now. People like Preston Pish, people like Mark Ross, uh, Mark Moss. Uh, shout out my old, my old mentor, Mark Ross. Um, but we also have Jack Maulers, who should be joining us on the desk for, for a brief moment. Michael Saylor will be on that desk as well. You're not going to want to miss the content we're putting out. Uh, and then, of course, the week after every other stage, all the exciting announcements that come from those stages, uh, as well as some fun videos that we've been putting together and cooking uh, in the kitchen for you guys. You're not going to want to miss this stuff, so please make sure you subscribe. When we hit that 69K subscriber number, the amount of sats that are going to get dropped are going to be so big. Philip Rizzo, the generational wealth you felt two days ago, whoo. It's going to pale in comparison to the amount of sats we're going to release once we hit 69K. Help us out. Get us there. Make sure you share it. Tell your friends. They're not going to want to miss this. And of course, if you want to come down to Miami, you can't come for the weekend. That's fine. We have the biggest, baddest festival planned for uh, Miami. I don't think Miami has ever had another festival quite like this. Yes, I know Ultra was last week, guys. I party more than most of you. Um, Ultra pales in comparison to what we have cooking at Sound Money Fest. It's only going to be on Saturday. Tickets are only $110 today. They go up tomorrow. Use code YTMAG, get 10% off your tickets. You don't need to take off work. Just come pop down to Miami. We'll have some fun. We'll be partying. David Bailey is going to let loose for one of the few times you're ever going to see him let loose. The stress is going to be released, and we're all going to just vibe and have a great time. You're not going to want to miss it because we are not bringing you any content from that. That is just going to be in the note. Maybe follow us on Twitter. Make sure if you're not following Chris or myself, give us a follow. Make sure you're also following the Bitcoin Conf, literally the Bitcoin Conf for all conference updates as well. Some special announcements are going to come out of there. I, I don't know. I've, I've said a lot of words, Chris. What did I miss? What did I forget? Yeah, I'll definitely say, you know, even though we're not going to be live streaming uh, Bitcoin Magazine live, the conference is going to be live, you know, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday next week. And like Q uh, said earlier, we have a bunch of curated content that hasn't been seen yet that'll be put up on Monday and Tuesday to fill your Bitcoin needs while we're gone. Uh, we will be having the main stage will be the main thing that's being live streamed. And we will also have the mining stage being live streamed as well. We have a couple other stages that we're going to have to put up videos the week after. So like Q, and Q said earlier, um, we're not going to be able to um, <clears throat> have Bitcoin Magazine live. We're going to be curating content and putting up all the content from that for all you guys to see, which we're really excited to bring you. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it, Q. Anything else on your mind right now? Yeah, I will share this this little thought that just popped into my head because I wanted to tease one of our biggest people we're going to have on this desk. I've already teased Michael Saylor will be on the desk. That is confirmed. Um, we're going to 
We're bringing them back, guys. The Mooch is returning. The Mooch will be on the desk with me, with Alex, with Pete Rizzo. I promise to play nice with him this time. You're not going to want to miss that. That is going to be the very first thing you see from the conference. We're going to go live starting at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Yes, it is sinking in right now that that means that's 5.30 for my internal clock. Justin Dushin, you're killing me with these call times of 7 a.m. Eastern. I'm honestly getting so nervous about having to show up to work at 4 a.m. internal clock time, but you know, Bitcoin never sleeps and neither do I. Let me tell you, you're not going to want to miss it. Set an alarm. Mooch VQ, the rematch on the Bitcoin conference desk, uh, 8.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Yeah. Um, uh, two other things to add. Uh, last night, our Earn Carrot team, they've been working very hard and diligently in the background. Uh, they sent an update very late last night. Uh, and the app, the Earn Carrot app, if you guys haven't already installed it to get some sats when we drop them in the in the chat or in the on the screen for the Bitcoin Magazine Live, they've revamped that. So make sure that you update the app as well as our very own Bitcoin conference team made their own app for the conference. No, this is not a tracking app. No, we don't want to like reveal your information or your cookies or anything like of that nature to the government. This is strictly to enhance your Bitcoin conference experience. Q, if you want to speak on to your experience last year, I know last year, I think a lot of people were taking pictures of it. I know the app's making it a lot easier. It shows the layout of the much bigger conference venue. And then also you can basically preset a schedule. Unfortunately, you won't be able to watch all the talks across all the stages. You're going to have to pick and choose. Obviously, there's some big ones. You don't want to miss the big announcements from Bukele or Jack Mallers, of course. But if you're more into open source uh, software, there's definitely a spot for you. If you're more into Bitcoin mining, if you're more into just seeing keynote speakers, they're going to be at various stages across um, across the, the whole conference. So Q, if you want to talk to your experience, how you think this app's going to help you and what you did last year for conference prep? prep. Dude, let, let me tell you, last year, I just won it. Like I, I circled names like Sailor, Preston Pish, uh, Maulers. Like I made a point to like go to those. I frankly was actually more focused on networking, meeting as many people as I could. Um, so I, I missed a fair bit of actual speeches and stuff, um, but was able to sort of go back onto the YouTube channel and watch those at a later time, which was very helpful for anyone attending the conference. Like I definitely recommend maybe picking a few uh, speakers that you want to go to and spending a majority of the time just, you know, checking out the whole area. I think the last I heard, it would take you from one side of the convention center to like the other end where we're, we have everything sort of set up. It can be as much as a 30 minute walk. So it's a big, it's a massive space. You're gonna wanna check everything out, everything that we have in store. Um, I mean, look, I wanna reiterate Chris's point, like the app itself, if you download it, you can see that it has no tracking sort of capabilities within the app. Just go into the settings tab and you can confirm that for yourself. You know, verify, don't trust. But I myself am using it, not because I'm a Bitcoin Magazine employee, but because it's just so helpful, so organized. I can set alerts that, hey, I need to know when this speech is starting for what we have going anyways. So like, I'm, I'm using it selfishly for work reasons, but even as just someone who's attending, it's super easy for you to be able to just use it. You can delete it right afterwards. We have confirmed that this will be the same app we end up using for Bitcoin 23 as well. So who knows, maybe we'll have uh, some special treats on the other side of the conference if you keep the app and we may do some carrot drops through the app. Uh, but regardless, it's just a more streamlined way rather than having to carry around some paper schedule or keep pulling it up on your phone the way I was doing. Like, wait, what time does this one start again? So it's all concise in one place. We hope it's very helpful for you guys. If there's something you don't like in it, or if there's something you would like to see added to it, feel free to reach out to us. We always want to help make this experience as best as possible for you. Um, and for anyone who is attending the conference as well, please make sure if, if you're not having a good time, if something's wrong, reach out to someone in the staff shirt and we'll help make sure that that issue is resolved. I know last year, one of the biggest issues was the 
lines for the bathroom, specifically the men's bathroom. In addition, the lines for food and drinks and whatnot. Um, but you know, Big Coming Magazine and BTC Inc. really responded well. And on day two, I think a lot of things were alleviated. I can promise you we should not have the same bathroom issue unless people just start to congregate around one bathroom in particular. But, you know, this is, we're, we're having our moment, guys. This is Bitcoin's Disneyland. Simple as that. It's going to be the happiest place on earth. And Mickey Mouse and Disney World, just a few hours north in Orlando, ain't got nothing on us. Fuck Epcot. Uh, I'm so excited for this conference, Q. I, I, to be honest, I know I've said, like, I'm really excited for the whole list of various things, improvements, whether we see more stuff about Taproot, Seed Signer, Impervious Browser, all that. But um, really, when I think about it, I'm really excited to hang out with the plebs. Not only hang out with you, Alex, uh, and a bunch of our other coworkers from the video team, as well as other people from uh, Bitcoin Inc. in general. Uh, I'm really excited to hang out with the plebs, the people that we get to communicate with, that we are fortunate enough to communicate with every day on this stream and, and all our various platforms. I think we're having an absolute blast hanging out. Um, and, you know, I think the, uh, I, Odell always brings up, he's like, the best conversations are had at 2 a.m. with, you know, a cup of bourbon or whatever drink of choice and, and your buddies talking about Bitcoin or even things unrelated to Bitcoin. So I'm really excited for that. I don't know about you, man. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I put a lot of faces to names and Twitter profiles last year. Um, there were moments like I fangirled so hard. Like I, Robert Breedlove walked by me and I was gushing like a little school girl. Um, it's it's going to be a great time. There's no better vibe than what Bitcoiners bring to the table. And I know that everyone who wasn't able to attend last year saw how epic it was. As someone who was there last year, let me tell you, it was even more epic than you could possibly imagine. Um, but let your imagination run wild because this one, this is going to be bigger, better, and just the FOMO is going to be real. And I apologize in advance. Um, simple as that, man. Don't, don't do this. Don't miss it. Use code YT mag, show up, show up. Definitely. Um, I think that's awesome. And for the people that can't make it, we're going to give you the best streaming uh, or the best live stream experience that we possibly can, you know, really looking forward to um, all, like everything that's going to go into this. I think there's going to be a lot of surprises. I know Q and I are excited for the surprise we have for you. P we had him on earlier this week on Tuesday, I believe, or Monday or Tuesday, I forget which stream it was. And uh, he's excited for ex surprises for, to provide Q and I, he's helping coordinate the whole conference. Um, yeah, Q, go ahead. Anything else you got? Yeah, I want to address, I know I see a lot of you guys in the YouTube chat talking about, excuse me, uh, Cash App being the sponsor. Um, and look, while I agree, like this is not an open source company, they have banned a lot of people for using their app. They've also helped bring access to a lot of unbanked and underprivileged people. They have helped our community immensely. Um, you know, not everyone does everything perfectly, but as a whole block and what they are pushing forward in Bitcoin is instrumental in what we are trying to do within Bitcoin as well. So while I agree that to a degree they have made mistakes in the past, we're not in the business of canceling people. You're more than welcome to have your opinions. You, that is your God-given right. However, we're not going to diminish. We are not going to bash. They do excellent work for a lot of people. They help bring banking access to underserved communities, and that cannot be ignored, nor should it ever be ignored. I want to reiterate that point because it is so instrumental in how Bitcoin is going to move forward. Everyone who has been underserved by the banking industry is going to look at Bitcoin as their opportunity, as their opt-out. And companies like Cash App have already started providing that outlet. And what happens? Better opportunities spring up. Then you have apps like Stripe coming up and essentially usurping them. Oh, Cash App, you're doing this. I'm going to do this better. That is what free market capitalism does. Cash App is just the first domino that fell for a lot of us. I'll admit, like I use, I used to use Cash App all the time to buy my Bitcoin. Not anymore, personally. I'm a, I'm a strike boy till, till I die. Shout out Jack Maulers. Thank you for making one of the best apps out there. I will only orange pill people using that. I will send people to other apps strictly so I can get a five or ten dollars of free Bitcoin from time to time because 
I am a little cheap like that. <laughs> um, I think it goes to show this is actually a great point and a great segue. Um, you know, while we, we like cash app and ultimately they've made mistakes in the past, uh, you know, we've made mistakes in the past as well. Um, I think Bitcoin doesn't fail when you're interoperating, like, or you're interoperable with the network. It fails at the company level or at the various levels or at the people level. I guess that's the best way to describe it. Like, you know, Bitcoin didn't fail with the Canadian truckers convoy, but that doesn't mean the Canadian government can't uh, strong arm or harm people that are helping people with adoption, you know, whoever it is. Uh, Bitcoin didn't fail with, um, you know, Russians who had Bitcoin in Bitcoin exchanges, but if they get cut off from the SWIFT system and they get orders from Putin or, or anywhere that they confiscate someone's Bitcoin from the exchange, whether it's Coinbase, whether it's Cash App, whether it's whatever, you know, um, they are basically getting strong arms. So, you know, I can send Q Bitcoin that I have in, in my possession to him without anyone stopping me. Uh, but that doesn't mean Do if it. I had it, it, what? Do it. Send me <laughs> free sats. I'm, I'm not sending him free sats anytime soon. Um, but um, no, I mean, that's the point. Like it cash up or not cash. App, Bitcoin doesn't fail when, when you use it peer to peer it fails at um, other verticals, whether it's other companies, whether it's bad exchanges, whether it's interoperating with the fiat system, like Bitcoin doesn't fail and it actually doesn't need me. It doesn't need to, it doesn't need Jack Dorsey. It doesn't need Elon Musk. Uh, it'll keep going. Uh, you know, people can do horrible things. You know, hopefully we don't end up in a nuclear war and, and the Bitcoin miners are still just plugged in, chugging away, earning Bitcoin, but like uh, there's no one here to, to use it. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's definitely a network that needs to be, um, use peer to peer and you want to mitigate your risk of having third party risk all the time. We saw on the hack just last week from uh, Bitcoin and crypto companies that were using third party vendors to aid them for whatever reason. And a lot of private information was given up. Some people admitted to the hack. Other people haven't said anything. Other people said things that I think that they didn't, they weren't very clear or they were like, oh, it's not that big of a deal. It's like, it can be a very big deal if if someone shows up at your house or threatens you or threatens to harm your family, that can be a huge deal. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else to add, Q. Look, it, it just goes back to not your keys, not your coin. Wait, not your coin. Wait, I always mess this up. Chris, save me. How, what's the right phrasing yeah. of this? Uh, no, <laughs> not your keys, not your coins. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, again, reminder, because I know I promised a lot of you this. No, I cannot smoke weed with you at the physical conference. I was politely asked to not do that. And I will respect those wishes. I will also be insanely busy at the physical conference. However, the after parties, feel free to come up to me. I will have way too much weed in my pockets at those things. <laughs> um, but also just a, a, a reminder, like, look, with some good comes some bad. We talk about this a lot on this show, like the Bitcoin network itself is decentralized based on the way it was built. But as we create these new companies to come in and sort of help us get more access to that network and use this network to further its capabilities, you create these centralized points where they're pressure points essentially. And the government can come in and request things. We've, we've seen it play out over the last three, four months at this point now. So keep that in mind. Like, yes, it's not the best. I agree with you. I hate, I hate corporate America. They're everything wrong and have led us to where we find ourselves now. And the reason why we have Bitcoin is to get away from this. But we have to, we have to also respect when businesses are trying to do everything they can under the rules that are in place today, right now. I have nothing but respect for what Block is doing. And I think we should all take a step back and appreciate the good while we criticize what they can do better. Um, that, that's all I want to touch on on that front. I mean, look, we can't, we can't please everyone. That's just the way the world works. I gave up on that a long, long time ago. I hope you guys are excited for today's episode. I know Chris and I have been looking forward to interviewing Patrick for quite some time. Um, so I don't, want to, I don't want to take away from what's about to come. Just a, another reminder, you know, use code YTMAG, get 10% off of your conference tickets come down. It's, it's where you're going to want to be plain and simple. I want to shout out some of the OGs who are in the chat right now. Hammersaw, we appreciate the entire time uh, that you've been watching us from pretty much day one. Um, Philip Rizzo, you're the man. You're definitely the cooler Rizzo. 
<laughs> um, um, anything, I guess you want to talk, touch on any Bitcoin news that's occurred? Um, anything you think of right now? All, all I'm thinking about is the conference and the fact that the Lakers need to get their shit together. Those are the only two thoughts that really go on in my mind these days. What, what about you? All right. Well, I, I got some news. Uh, the 19th millionth Bitcoin will be mined tomorrow. So that's exciting stuff. You know, that leaves only 2 million Bitcoin to be mined left. Um, then also, I know uh, mempool.space, they're adding more. Uh, I know many people use that for looking at blocks as they come in on various nodes or various uh, apps on their nodes. They're adding more information about mining, which is really, really cool. So I'm really looking forward to, to seeing that update uh, come to fruition. I think there's some really cool stuff like that. Anything else you're seeing or anything else you're uh, looking for? Yeah, I mean, I think to be honest, and I think it's just been such a slow news cycle week right now based on the fact that we have the conference next week. Everyone's trying to keep as much information close to their chest. I did promise in our staff meeting this morning that I would release uh, new betting odds for the lightning or not, sorry, for the Jack Mahler's announcement. I know that we're, uh, we're seeing a lot of different memes come out online of what could this announcement possibly be. I, I liked Chris, what you were talking about of the milk network getting incorporated with Apple so that strike and Bitcoin could start being used on the Apple uh, payment networks. I also kind of buy into the idea that Jack Mahler's is just trolling everyone. Um, however, I'm going to make the milk Apple connection at a, plus 350 plus 350 by the way i am the house so if you want to make any of these bets just dm me and we can arrange that we're not condoning gambling youtube this is not a gambling show we're just degenerates that there's a difference there's a big difference um i will say that this though i don't buy into this idea that bukele is not going to steal the thunder from another country i just don't I genuinely go back and forth on this, but I firmly believe that Bukele is going to announce and I'd love it to be Turkey. I'd love it to be Turkey, in my opinion, because now you start to see Bitcoin in fact, using that word in the most positive context possible. Um, but to have, you know, Bitcoin as legal tender in the Central America touching North and South America, in essence, with El Salvador. Then you have um, Turkey, which is on the border of both Asia and Europe as a European nation. You all of a sudden are starting to see Bitcoin really cement itself in locations that are prime for trade. And look, as a business major, as someone who, yes, I did go to college and I majored in business. I know how ridiculous that sounds. Um, but one of the first things you were ever taught, and I was taught this in like the eighth grade, what is instrumental in any business location, location, location. And let me tell you, Bitcoin being located now centrally in Central America, and then again, over in Turkey, that is prime location for a lot of trade to just funnel through. I also don't hate the idea of Panama because now you have the canal, which is going to have a lot of trade coming through. We're seeing a lot of supply chain issues. Like those aren't dying down anytime soon. All of a sudden you can pay for your, your cargo ships to go through with Bitcoin. These are all net positives. I will say it. I will say it and I'll say it again. All news is good news for Bitcoin. Um, exactly. It, it's just, and look, I've pressed a lot of guests on this show. I've discussed my opinions on the potential of Russia adopting Bitcoin. We saw news today that Putin is going to very aggressively not sell gas unless countries are paying in rubles. Um, does that mean the rubles value is going to increase in the short term? Yeah, I think you're quietly seeing him create a fiat currency now backed by oil which is going to be a very interesting and tricky thing that he is doing. Um, but eventually I think they will, they will be adopting Bitcoin, I think much sooner than 
much of the Western world, many Western Bitcoiners may be comfortable with. Bitcoin doesn't care. It just doesn't care. Um, that That's just my little, little rant. I don't want to get too into the Russia of it all. I, I actually want to explore this conversation with Patrick a little bit, but I'd love your thoughts, Chris. Yeah, no, I think um, I think that's a really good point. And I think uh, Nolan brought it up in his episode of The Breakup a few weeks ago at this point. Um, it was on the back of the Russia-Ukraine, um, the beginning of the conflict there. And he basically was calling it the death of the petrodollar. And I mean, it's taken a little bit like what we're coming up on just over a month at this point of, of this conflict going on. But starting tomorrow, they said that they're going to be accepting uh, rubles for payment of oil or and or gas in order to do that. And basically, we in in years past, the United States would go to war with much smaller oil rich nations over this very thing, saying that they're going to use the euro, they're going to use some other form of payment, um, you know, gold or whatever. And um, to, to your point with this, I mean, Putin's saying do it and go ahead. Like he's got it's it's it was a blunder I, and i'm not an expert in geopolitical but it was a blunder to basically back a guy into a corner that has access to more nukes than anyone else on the world more than biden more than uh xi from china like it's it, you're you're like putting a scared animal into a corner and that does not normally end with great results and and i'm speaking for that like i hope nothing bad comes out of it but this is the least bad of, of anything that can happen yeah, Q and I and Americans are going to see uh, our influence and, and power, I guess you want to call it, of our financial system wane because of that. Um, and we're at more threat of hyperinflation. I mean, it was little over uh, a couple months, like what, almost six months ago that Jack Dorsey in October literally said hyperinflation period or whatever. And basically he was lambasted by mainstream media, by politicians, senators, congressmen and women. Um, and yeah, it was just pretty crazy. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there's your thoughts. No, I, I love that. I mean, look, I've, I've put my tinfoil hat on. I've pointed out a lot of, a lot of connections between the last time the, the petrodollar was attacked and what that led to. So I don't want to, I don't want to go down that path again. I'm just going to say use code YT mag, get 10% off your conference tickets. Um, stick around through this commercial break. And afterwards we're going to be joined by Patrick bet David, and we're going to be talking the future of Bitcoin. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for sticking through that commercial break. And as promised, we are joined by entrepreneur, writer, podcast host, CEO. I can list so many different names and titles for a man who has accomplished so much. Um, but we are joined now by Patrick Bet David. Patrick, how are you doing today? I'm good. It's good to be on with you guys. Thank you for joining us. Um, I, I want to start where I think I discovered you, and I think I believe Chris as well. Uh, you wrote one of my favorite books, Your Next Five Moves. It's a way that I love to approach what I try to accomplish a lot of times. Uh, talk to us a little bit 
a about the inspiration behind this and if you don't mind sharing for for many of our viewers and listeners who aren't aware of sort of what the next five moves should look like absolutely so for me your next five moves was a question i used to ask when i got out of the military and i would ask myself so what do i do first do i first you know go get a job do i first go you know sell do i first go you know college do i get a degree what do i do and you know do, everything with everybody I was speaking to, I would always ask about the sequencing. What should I do now first? A lot of times we'll talk to somebody who's extremely successful and he'll ask him, hey, so, so tell me the key to success. You know, what does your schedule look like today? And they'll give you a schedule, but that does nothing for you if you're a startup entrepreneur. I'd rather ask the question of, hey, you know, John, you're worth $200 million today. You've done very well for yourself. But when you first started a company, can you tell me what the schedule looked like the first 12, 24, 36 months? So I wanted to know that everything to me was about sequencing because the best of the best in any business in military, in politics, in sports, in finance, in investments, in anything you talk about, if you really were to break down those who went at the highest level, what is the one thing they have in common? Put all the people that have hard work. I know a lot of hardworking people that are not as successful that others, but if you put the guys at the top that do very well, you'll see a very clear sequencing on what their next moves are. So, so often, like we want to do move number 14 at move two, or you have aspirations to do something really big, but that's number 28. It requires a little bit of patience, but we want to make 28 to number three, and it throws everything off and it breaks it. So you need a little bit of patience, intuition, uh, willingness to think long-term, but that's the real premise behind your next five moves. I love that. And I'd love to maybe dissect a little bit, like, for example, this last weekend on the email, you shared uh, some things for, for example, being grateful for everything that we have right now, being focused on what, what to attack, uh, maybe break down a little bit of what are your next five moves right now for us? Yeah. So my next five moves vary uh, based on many different areas of my life. So for example, my health, let's talk about my health. I'm 43 years old. What the health issues I had in my 20s are different than 30s are different than 40s. So 20s, you know, I, I had a harder time putting on muscle because I'm skinnier. My metabolism was fast. So I needed more protein intake and I needed less cardio. I was doing way too much cardio so I could build on mass, right? Well, my body could eat pizza, could eat carbs, it could eat everything and I wouldn't be affected by it. 30s, you know, my health, it was more, you know, I can't now get away with eating anything. Like, Drinking soda, bread had bigger effect on my life. Like, you know, if I ate pizza, I would actually feel, you know, like full and it'd be uncomfortable. 40s has been flexibility. So it's more important in 40s to be flexible. So for my health with the trainer that I got, it's the first time I got a trainer that's my height, my body type. So, and he was a professional wide receiver before. So he's training me in a different way. My diet's different. The things I eat is different. You know, the last time I had soda was July of 2020 is the last time I had soda. And I love Coke Zero. And that was my, you know, thing that I would drink all the time. I do Coke Zero, but that's what I do. So my, my body is a different, your next five moves I got. I got four kids, which means my energy needs to be higher. I run a good eight companies um, where it requires me to stay steady, to have the energy. Yesterday, my day ended at 1230. One o'clock in the morning, I was at, tr at the gym training this morning at six o'clock. So tracking my, you know, sleep scores, whether this is the Aura app or the DNA, because I need to know my blood type. I, I'm, it's just more understanding the, the health side. On the family side with the kids, for each of my kids, I break down their own individual next five moves. So my middle son, Dylan, is extremely uh, athletic. And for us, you know, I, I first, I, you know, I first give them different things to see what draws them in. And then all of a sudden, my middle son sports, you know, he loves soccer. So I get him the best coach here that played professional. He's coaching him on a one-on-one -on -one basis. My oldest son, he's more about coding. So we're sending him to a six week coding camp to learn about editing, video editing, movie production, all that stuff. Cause that's him. He likes to draw. As a matter of fact, I'm you know, about to launch some nfts for my kid because this guy's always drawing stuff so i said hey what if we do your own nft project so he has his own identity around something he's creating uh in regards to marriage it's a complete different thing with my marriage my wife you know we've been married 12 and a half years soon to be 13 we take it one year at a time but everything what is the next five moves at this phase of our lives wealth same thing finances same thing business 
what my insurance company needs next with the hiring. We just hired a CTO. Uh, we made the offer. He accepted. This will be our eighth C-suite executive that we just brought on board. I like who this guy's his background is. This is technology is becoming a big part of our business. And then on media side, what I'm doing, podcasts, we had a very uh, extensive meeting on specifically what we're doing with our business. So your next five moves, if I really were to talk about all aspects of my life, I mean, we'd be here for three hours talking about this. I don't want to do that with you. But all I'm saying is too often we only think about our next five moves in one area. Why don't you try to break it down and see the next five moves in personal, health, marriage, parenting, relationship, finance, net worth, investments. When you break it down that way, it's actually such a fun exercise. If you grab a, a board, like even if you just grab a paper and pen, I always got paper like this next to me. If you just grab a paper and pen, you make circles. And then underneath them, you put the next five moves for each one of them. Then you put that on the screensaver on your computer when you're looking at it every day. Like you get jacked up about all these different things that you got going on. So yeah, my next five moves, it's a whole, we need a couple cigars to go through all of them. All right. Well, I will find you with a couple cigars, but until then, I want to ask about balance because what you've just thrown at me, I, I have no children. I have a girlfriend, thankfully, a business that I start from the ground up and then this, and I'm overwhelmed. How do you keep balance in, with everything you have going? Yeah. So, so uh, keep this part in mind that um, like, for example, somebody looks at an Elon Musk and they'll say, I'd never want the guy's life. Of course, you're not going to want the guy's life, but can you imagine Elon Musk also looks at your life and says, I could never have your life. So it's very important for everybody to understand that just because somebody has a life doesn't mean you have to have that life. You know, I look at my kids and a lot of people think, you know, I expect them to be just like me. And here's what, not at all. My only outcome with my kids is who they want to be, the kind of life they want to live and how we can figure out their talents to apply it in areas that get them excited, right? For me, I can't see myself doing anything else. Like, let, let me put, I, I can't see myself doing anything else than where I'm at today. You know, my challenge is more every single time I sit down and talk to my team uh, oh, and I'm talking, so let's just say I host a call. Many times I host a call and have everybody on my lawyer, my accountants, all the different kind of uh, investment bankers I have. I have a call and there'll be 20 of them on, right? If I'm making a big decision in my life and I get them all on, that, that one Zoom could cost me $6,000 because this guy's 800 bucks an hour. That guy's 600 bucks an hour. This guy's 400 bucks an hour. But they're all seeing the big plans of what I'm doing. And the lawyer will say, no, I don't think you should do that. Then the lawyer and the accountant will get into a debate. Then the investment banker is going to say, I don't think it's that bad of an idea because you guys got to think about it from this way. Oh, that's a good perspective. And I'm listening, right? I'm listening to where we are. But I'm more in the game right now where I have to take things out. I have to take things out. This is why I don't golf. This is why I don't add new, like I'm a, I'm a good pool player, billiards. And I actually love playing the game of pool. Uh, but if I were to play pool six hours a week and I have an obsessive personality, I just lost six hours a week. I don't have six hours. So I got four kids. I got businesses. So I need that time with the kids. So it's trying to see what things I like to take off the plate and use that time to put it in things I'm in love with and I'm obsessed with. That's like I used to be in so many, you know, hey, you guys on a poker tournament? You guys are doing this. You guys are doing that. No. I just went from here and the more and more and more I go here and I put it in fewer things, I get more depth, I get a bigger rate of return. And then at the same time, you know, it may look overwhelming from the outside, which I understand. But if you were on the inside with me and you would see the team we have around us, then you would say, oh, I see how he does it. Every time he moves up, he just hires better quality people smarter than him in the area that he's hiring, which gives him back nine more hours a week six more hours a week, three more hours a week for me to be more effective. So it may seem overwhelming, but if you have the right people around you and you're doing it the right way, you, you'll be actually surprised how, how capable you are of scaling your own time. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And uh, you definitely bring up like a lot of people get external motivation. I know Michael Jordan was always famous. Uh, I know you're a big sports guy for like finding external motivation. And people said, I never said that to Jordan, but he just thought of it himself, yeah. even Tiger Woods or all these people. Um, I know, and I think you outline it in your book very well that it's not trying to become, you know, I'm not trying to become better than you. I'm just trying to become the next better of myself. 
Um, and you're always trying to, everyone's competing against themselves. Yeah, I can use external motiva motivation in order to get there, but I think it really comes down to your own philosophies and you know, bringing them internal and then just you're always, everyone's competing against themselves. Uh, so I guess what's your life philosophies and then how do you instill them in your kids? I know the last two years have been very, very difficult for kids. I don't have them. I have younger siblings and I know Q doesn't have any kids, but uh, these past two years, I mean, they've been tough for us adults, but I really, really feel for the kids and them growing up. So what are your philosophies and how you instill them in their kids and how do they get through these difficult times? I, I think what you just said was very important where, look, it, to me, above everything, like whether you want to call it happiness or fulfillment or joy, whatever you want to call it. Everything from there comes from alignment. Everything to me is about alignment. If, if my values and principles I live by matches the way I'm living, I'm the happiest. If my values and principles I live by and I speak and I teach to others, but I don't live by them, it's when things are out of whack in my personal life. And, and many times you'll, you'll go through that. So let's just say, for instance, you got seven non-negotiables in your life about relationships. Or let's say you got three non-negotiables and you date this girl. And this girl you date, two of the non-negotiables she has. And you're like, she's hot as hell, man. But she's, dude, my friends see her. They're like drooling over the fact that I landed a girl this hot, right? And then a month goes by, you feel weaker. Two months go by, you feel weaker. Four months go by, you feel weak because you compromise your two non-negotiables. And then you're angry at her. She didn't do nothing wrong. You compromise your two non-negotiables. You only had three of them. Why'd you compromise the two? So then you're not aligned. So your values and principles don't match, you know, the way you're living and you're fighting you. So you're now angry at everybody else. My, my experience in life has been when I have bitter people around me and every family member's got bitter and sometimes we've been the one that, that's bitter. Everybody that I've seen around me that's been bitter, they've lived an unaligned life. Every time I've been bitter, I've lived an unaligned life. I can tell you that for a fact. So let's just say you're somebody that says, you know, external, internal, what you, what you said there. Let's say you look at somebody and you admire them and you really want to do something big. And you know you're capable of it. But internally, you make a lot of excuses. You're lazy. You're always blaming somebody else. That's an out of whack alignment. So you're now going to secretly have a little bit of envy for a guy that's not as good as you, that you could beat that guy, but he's willing to pay the price and he lasts longer. He has a little bit more patience than you. Now you envy him. But why do you envy him? Well, why is there any sort of jealousy? Well, then because you know deep down inside, you're not giving your best and you're trying to make an excuse to actually avoid doing the work. That's also when we're out of whack. So now let's talk about the kids in COVID. The last couple of years that you're asking about, as weird as this sounds, COVID was the best thing that happened to my family. In regards to my relationship with my kids, let me explain to you why. Um, so when COVID happened, they shut down the schools, kids had to stay home. And I'm running businesses, I can't afford to stay home. And I was not necessarily an essential business, which means I couldn't go to the office, but I went to the office every single day, including Sunday, the, from March 12th to whatever the day was when Donovan Mitchell gave, got COVID from, uh, who's the center he has? Rudy Gobert. Uh, yeah, Rudy Gobert. And he was pissed off at each other. And Disney shut down, Universal shut down, NHL shut, shut down. That one day, we all remember, the next three months, I was only not at the office for one Sunday. I was at the office every day. Like, if it's 90 days, I was there 89 days. So what did I do? My kids are staying home. I'm like, oh, we got to create a routine. I started a routine for my kids. Both my boys had to make 52 basketball shots per day, not shoot, but make. So I had a basketball court in, a, in the back of my office and I would park the car, I would bring the ball and they would have to make 52 shots per day. Then they would watch a one hour documentary. Then they would be required to read 20 pages. And we started that every day. Do you know from the moment I started that till the, today, I've taken these kids all over the world, no matter where we are, they read 20 pages, Every single day, they're watching something every single day, and they've grown into who they are. We're closer, our relationship's better. You know, in every possible way, there's an expectation. They've read a few hundred books. Now the youngest knows she's about to turn six. At six years old in our family, you're required to read 10 pages a day. Then it goes to 20 pages a day. Then when you reach double digits, it's 40 pages of small books or 20 pages of big books. Anyway, so there are systems that we follow in the David family. So I, I, my wife and I use COVID uh, as an opportunity to get closer to our kids for them to know, hey, we learned that if shit was hit the fan and we had to homeschool, we could. So essentially for two years, 
we created our own regiment of developing our kids. If I ever ran a school, if I ever have a university one day, you go to something called Bed David University, say 20 years from now, you know, just like Oxford, Harvard said, there's Bed David University. The routines we would follow with the incentive plans that we would have, I feel confident that we're now at this age of our kids, we can develop them. So uh, it was actually a very good opportunity for us to get closer and develop them. And I don't recognize my kids today. They're not the same as they were two years ago. Just the conversations we have with them, the level of depth, how they challenge me now. And, you know, I'm driving the other day with them in the car and I say, hey, daddy, Tico Dylan Senna. Tico is a nickname for Patrick. His name is Patrick. I say, hey, Tico Dylan Senna, uh, question for you guys. Are we one day going to be in business together? Like, are we going to run companies together? And they're like, daddy, that's a pretty tough question. Let us think about it. I'm like, what? Yeah, let, let us think about it. I'm like, Okay, 20 minutes, they're quiet. I don't hear them talking to me. I'm driving. I'm looking at them and I'm like, these guys are talking to each other. And then 20 minutes and they're like, yeah, that we talked about it. We're going to go into business with each other. We don't need you. It's going to be us going into business together. I'm like, freaking awesome. I was so proud of these guys. But they didn't talk like this a year ago, two years ago. So again, COVID got them to get this muscle to get stronger, which is pretty exciting. I'm looking forward to your future parenting book. Um, I want to ask this. It's, it's an answer. I feel like we both know what you're going to say, but I genuinely am curious. What are you most grateful for right now? This is probably the most grateful I've been in my life though. You know, it's, it, it, the list is a long list. My dad is still alive. He's going to turn 80 in two weeks, April 10th in 11 days, he's going to turn 80. You know, when my dad had a heart attack in 93, 94, he would smoke two, he smoked two packs a day for 30 years. I grew up in a house where they would smoke two packs a day. My mom and my dad. My mom would smoke one. My dad would smoke two packs a day. And the doctor said, you know, 50% of your heart is black. You're going to be lucky if you live 10 years. And this is 93, 94. For him to be here to 2022, he's turning 80. He lives in my house. You kid me? My sister moved here from LA. My dad moved here from LA. Our kids all go to the same private school together. It's the first time. All five of them going to the same private school. My nephew, my niece. I got a four kid, but she's only eight, nine months old. So she'll eventually go to the same school with these guys. Life is good. Life, there's a lot of things to be grateful about right now. Uh, even though the last 24 months, it's been a pretty divisive last 24 months. People have been, you know, pinned against each other. We, you know, when 9-11 happened, we all were aligned. Nobody cared, cared whether you were white, black, Hispanic, Asian. Nobody cared. You're American? I got your back. Nobody said, did you vote for Bush or did you vote for Kerry? Nobody cared. Just where is your kid? I don't know where he's at. Let me go help you. Let's go, right? Versus this time around when COVID hit, instead of making the enemy where this thing came from, we made each other the enemy, which was, which was catastrophic. Rather than sitting there being grateful the fact that we're living in the greatest country in the world, we started nitpicking everything. We started sitting there and nitpicking everybody, everything, as if we're going to all get along. And then we don't even think about the fact that, say you put two people in the same room together who have complete opposite sides politically. Do you realize even those two people who have complete opposite sides politically, 90% of the things in life, they, all, they both agree with, 90%. But we are so obsessed with the 10% of stuff we disagree with. So I'm in a very grateful state uh, and I got a long list of things to be grateful for, but those would be some of the things I'm grateful for today. Thank you for sharing those. I mean, I just continue to appreciate all of the advice and guidance that you provide guys like Chris and I and all the people around the world. Um, but I, I do want to shift the conversation uh, a little bit now to through a more business lens. Uh, I think all of us would agree that we are all free market capitalists at its core. Uh, however, we don't have that. I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit and say, what are things that you notice in the market that prevent us from having that? And you cannot say corporate bailouts because everyone says corporate bailouts. Yeah, I, I would say, uh, I think lobbyists are ruining everything uh, because to me, uh, uh, the, the part of, you know, when, whenever you talk about people who hate capitalism, they don't realize 90% of the things they're complaining about is stuff I agree with. Meaning, uh, uh, well, crony capitalism. Yeah, I can't stand it either. Lobbyists, I agree. I don't think lobbyists improve things, but the system of lobbyists is not going to go away because what most congressmen and women do after they work for 8, 10, 12, 20 years, making 170 per year or whatever their number is going to be now after the 22% raise, 
most of these guys go work for a law firm and they become lobbyists and they go from making 200 grand a year to now legally being able to make two to six million a year. Some of them make 10 to 20 million a year, right? That's a big difference for you to go from a congressman's income of making 170 to 200 to not making two to 10 million dollar your income as a lobbyist. They don't want that model to go away. So imagine how many congressmen and women there is. Do you think we can really get rid of this lobbying system? I don't know. Uh, the other part is with, you know, when it comes down to voting, uh, I think the voting is a challenge for me. Uh, uh, if, if, if we look at voting in too much of a way of, um, here's how I look at voting. I'll just explain it to you. It's pretty controversial. Most people, you know, sit there and say, what are you talking about, Pat? If you lived in my house and if I live with my parents, if I'm not paying rent, if I'm not paying the phone bill, if I'm not paying anything, but if I want to tell my parents what color paint to put on the wall, I'm sorry, I don't have any moral authority. If, if I work for, you know, if I'm, if I'm, going to Omaha, Nebraska, because Berkshire Hathaway is holding their annual shareholders meeting for A shares and Charlie Munger and Buffett are hosting the meeting. And I go in there and I say, hey, Warren, I don't like the way you hired that person recently. You should fire that person. And Warren's going to be like, I'm sorry, who are you? I, I, I'm Patrick the David. How many shares do you own in Berkshire Hathaway? It doesn't matter. It's unfair. I think you should not have hired that CEO. You should have hired this person. Who the hell are you? How many shares have you bought? What have you contributed to Berkshire Hathaway? Nothing, but you should listen to me, right? Now, obviously, this is a controversial way of thinking about it. But to me, you know, the new four-letter F word is earn. Earn is a bad word today. Earn is offensive. Earn is, you know, you're making people feel bad. You know, how could you say the word earn? Yeah, I, everything to me is about earning the right to vote, earning the right to tell me what color paint should be in your room because you got a job and you're paying mommy and daddy $300 a month, earning the right to say you want to be with Droid instead of Apple because you give me $100 a month and you have the right to tell me, daddy, I don't want an iPhone. I want a Droid phone. No problem. You're paying 100 bucks a month. You get to choose what you want to do with your phone. Today, we have this phone that's got these apps called TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, that everybody without having earned the right to vote, just because you're great at screaming and hollering, people think you're right because you scream louder. My daughter is five years old. No one in the house screams louder than she does. That doesn't mean she runs the house. She just screams very loud. And she's very, very loud, right? That doesn't mean she pays the bills. That doesn't mean she makes the decisions. So I, I think we've gotten away from who the hero is. America's missed the mark on the hero making the machine. You know, if you go back and you think about who a hero was 40 years ago versus who a hero is today, we've missed the mark. We're confused. I don't know if kids know who the hero is. I, I don't, I, if kids went to school, you know, your hero was, it, it was either the best performer, you know, you're like, ah, I'd love to be the greatest rock star or the greatest athlete, Michael Jordan, or I'd love to be, you know, the, the greatest president, or I'd love to be the greatest businessman or the greatest... But it was like, man, we were looking at heroes. Oh, wow, that's exactly what, versus today, it's, man, I want to be the greatest complainer when I grow up, because that's what's getting the most recognition. So capitalism, lobbyist, voting system, you know, the, the fact that these guys can get out and create by congressmen to get them to change a vote or a law or a bill that's going to make it tougher for the smaller business to come and compete with them. I think those are some of the challenges we're facing today. And I will tell you, to try to change that, let's just say if somebody said, that's what I'm going to do, and I'm going to go to try to change that. That's great. It's very noble. There is hundreds of congressmen, senators, you know, other people in public office that are not going to let you change that. So it needs to be a collective effort of people that sit there and say, this just makes sense. And it can't be like just 100,000 or a million. We need to get tens on top of tens of millions of people who are loud talking to finally start making sense to you know match the complainers to eventually say wow these guys are these guys are actually starting to make sense they got a big voice and then you'll start seeing some changes but that's what i would say to you about capitalism curious i love this argument this is not one that we've ever really had on this show uh, how much credence do you give to the fact that there are no term limits in congress and the fact that congress has essentially raised their salary pretty much consistently since World War II. How much 
did those play into this idea that lobbyists are telling them what to do, i.e. the corporations? I mean, you just answered a question, right? Term limits is a big problem. You know, if you, if you, if, if I'm, I'm a CEO of a company, right? Okay. If I have a board who owns 51 plus percent of the company, can you imagine if I have something in place that I can stay CEO as long as I want and I'm doing a shitty job and I'm on, have no limits on it? Like it, it just wouldn't make any sense. There's got to be a voting system to say you got to be out, which by the way, we have a voting system for the most part, they can do that. But yeah, you know, a, a person comes in, they're fresh, they're exciting. You know, yeah, listen, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, we should look at this, fiat currencies, all oh, that's not working, NFTs and all this stuff. But a person that's been in Congress for 42 years or 38 years, yeah, no, uh, Bitcoin, no, it's horrible, crypto, horrible, because they got a call from somebody from Chase or one of the biggest guys in New York telling them, hey, this thing is hurting our business. They just crossed a trillion dollars. This is hurting our business. We cannot, we got to make it hard for them. Don't worry, I got you. I got you. I got you. You know, versus if we had more 28 year olds, 35 year olds, 42 year olds, you know, people who are fresh and exciting and they go for two, two terms, eight years or four terms, eight years, whatever. I think eight years is plenty of time. And you bring the new guy and a new guy and a new guy. Well, then now we got something exciting going. Ain't nobody in the NBA trying to build a team. If, if, imagine if we allowed somebody today to say, I'm going to build, build a super team. Really? Yeah. Who are you going to put on your team? Michael Jordan. It, he's about to turn 60. Yeah, but that's one of my draft picks. Okay, who else? Magic. M Magic's also about to be 60. I want him. Bill Russell. Bill, Bill can't walk. <laughs> but Bill is one of the greatest champions of all time. Overrated. <clears throat> Larry Bird. You're going to put Bird? Do you remember Bird's back problems at 32? What kind of back problems do you think he's got right now at around 55? And, and I, want, I want Charles Barkley. What are you talking about? One time Charles running down and back, he's going to want to get out of the, uh, you know, sit down. He needs a break. So it doesn't mean those players are not the greatest top 20, 30 players of all time. It just means it's time for them to retire and let other younger players play the game today. If the Congress was a sports team, it'd be filled with players that I just gave you that wouldn't win a championship because they don't play today's game. You need players to play today's game. I, I think the game is so boring today with these people that have been there for 20, 30, 40 years, and they're not really, their passion is gone. It's more about favors and being part of the, elite class and being invited to those parties and all those things, they've forgotten the fact that they wanted to change the world. It's no longer about changing the world. It's about living a longer life. It's different fears you got. So yeah, we, we need some people to be fired and we need some new blood. I, I love that. That's a great answer. I know there's a question. I watched your interview with Joe Rogan, which anyone that hasn't seen it, I highly recommend you go and check it out. It was really great. So I'm going to flip the script. So you got to ask this to Joe, but I want the opportunity to ask this to you. You listed the five most powerful people or entities, one of them being billionaires, the Elon Musk, the Jeff Bezos, virtual governments or big tech, as you called it, Facebook, Amazon, Google, et cetera. Uh, the education institutions, I guess you were talking more about uh, legacy universities, the president of the United States and mainstream media were the five that you listed. So I know you and Joe got to go back and forth, but I didn't really get to hear your order. So if you had to rate them from one being the most powerful to five being the least powerful, how would you see uh, that? And then I'm going to tie it back in. I promise this will loop back in. I'm going to go virtual governments as number one is mm -hmm. what I would put. I'm looking at it right now. I'm going to go educational system as number two. And I can explain my reasoning behind it. If you ask, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to go probably. Um, billionaires, number three, mainstream, number four, president, number five. Wow. Uh, I'd love for you to expand on the universities being number two real quick before I ask the follow-up question. Absolutely. So, here, so so, I'm thinking whatever has the longest lifespan. President's only got four to eight, so you don't matter. You're going to be gone anyways. You're going to be fired. So you're the least important, most powerful person. And I know we say it's the most powerful person in the world. You're not really as powerful as you think you are. It's four to eight years. You're going to be gone. So there's no term. There is term limits for that, right? Okay. Four, mainstream media is controlled by billionaires. So mainstream media is irrelevant without the billionaire. So you're as irrelevant as the president is, you're last, second to last, right? Billionaires 
or John Malone is trying to buy CNN. He's powerful. And if he buys CNN, he can move stuff, right? So who just bought Forbes? For the longest time, Malcolm Forbes took Forbes over his father, took it from 100,000 subscribers in 1959 to some 750,000 subscribers. Forbes became a multi-billionaire. And in everything he had, he would call it the capitalist tool. Then his son takes it over Steve Forbes. And he just sold 95% of Forbes to China. And Forbes just announced their International Woman Award of the Year, and it went to Hillary Clinton. I'm so confused. Do you know how many other women entrepreneurs we have that have created thousands of jobs, who started a company and grew it, kept marriages together, raised kids, ran companies, nursed, risk, fear, all, and we announced her as very confused. So again, bottom is president, four is mainstream media, three is billionaires, Two is going to be at universities because universities, again, they have a longer lifespan, right? 40 years, 60 years. Harvard's going to be around for a long time. It's not like they sit there and they worry about presidents. So the curriculum taught at a university can persuade kids to turn against their parents. So it's catastrophic. And last but not least, virtual governments, because as much as we talk about freedom of speech, the freedom of speech ruling, I think section 203, whatever, whatever it's section 230. Uh, two, two, 230, the, yeah. 230, section 230, it does not apply to private companies. Section 230 only applies to the government, but it doesn't apply to, so, so for example, Dennis Prager and his wife, Sue, who's a lawyer, they sued, uh, uh, they sued the YouTube, right? Because of they removed some 80 videos or whatever it was. They went to court and the judge was like, the YouTube doesn't have to follow the guideline freedom of speech of America because they're a private entity. America does, YouTube doesn't. So, and, and how many people are watching TV today? Everything is here. So these guys control the world. So that's, that's, by, by the way, no one's ever asked me this question, but I would say that'd be my top five. No, I think that's great. And uh, I think kind of like to your point, uh, not to poke fun at Hillary Clinton, but it's exactly like your lineup of basketball players from the past. They're living in the past instead of in the present and the future where it's going. Uh, you know, take stealing another quote from Wayne Gretzky, always ski where, or skate where the puck's going, not where it was or is. Um, so I guess expanding on that. So you just recently had Michael Saylor on and, uh, you were kind of drinking from the fire hose. I know it was a good two hour long stint. Michael Saylor is a, a really good thing. Q, you want to hop in with something real quick? Wait, I, I want to expand on this educational thing because I'm, I'm curious. I, I give credence to the fact that Harvard has been around for hundreds of years and will continue to be around. We witnessed though, during the pandemic, when school started to go online, there was a conversation of what does the cost of tuition look like if you're going to have universities online? Harvard, Harvard actually very loudly said, our tuition is going to be the same because it's a degree from Harvard and that carries a certain level of weight. But it started to raise this question of, okay, maybe at, at a certain caliber, fine. But I went to GW and the price tag, frankly, cost more than going to Harvard and it was not worth it. I, I am of the notion that you know, when your kids get older, or when I, when Chris eventually have kids and they're going to college, there's going to be a longer conversation of what is actually the net benefit here. Does that play into any sort of where you think that industry and that sort of uh, ranking will go? I think, I, I, man, I, I think that system, the educational system, we have not yet seen disruption. Like, you know, Udemy, plural site or whatever, or you, we haven't seen disruption yet. Watch somebody absolute like somebody can come out and absolutely destroy universities the next 10 years and and it, and it could be as quickly as newspapers like you know we used to read in the paper right it could be like this it could be how blockbuster fell and netflix just came and said bye bye you could have bought us for 50 million you didn't now you guys are not innovative you got to go and be the story in the cemetery of businesses that didn't innovate that died right same with Kmart, same with Circuit City, same with a lot of these companies. I, I don't think we've seen disruption yet in the educational side fully. I, I think they're sitting in their boardrooms frightened and they have to constantly provide and sell us on the value. Okay, so my kids, people say, well, you wrote a book called Drop Out and Get School, then you're all about against yes, universities and all this other stuff. You know, your kids wanna go to school. What are you gonna do? You're gonna tell them not to go to school? No, I'm gonna tell them if they want to go, they should go. They're going to have a couple options with daddy. If you go to school and you graduate and you get a full ride scholarship, you're going to have a fund of a quarter million dollars to half a million dollars sitting there to use with whatever you want to do for money. Now, what universities and what degrees am I not going to be paying money for? You want a fine arts degree? I'm not funding that. 
You want a philosophy degree? Go pay it on your own. Go for it. It's totally fine. I respect it. But I'm not funding that. I'm funding skill sets. You want to be a doctor? I'll fund you. You want to be a attorney? No problem. You want to be an accountant? Totally get a STEM. We'll fund all of that stuff, right? Okay. Educational side today with schooling, COVID took that experience of relationship out, networking out, learning other people's culture, what it was like to have a little bit of hanging out with each other and prospecting somebody as somebody you can do business with. Like, you know how, you know, Zuck met Edward and hey, Edward's dad gave, I don't know, $18,000 and that thing turned into whatever it is. That networking opportunity is what's really the biggest value of a great university you go to. That to me is above everything else. When I went to Harvard's OPM program, the owner president management program, you spend like $50,000 go to your own campus for three weeks. Uh, I went to it and uh, for the three weeks I was there, I can't tell you, you know, what I learned from many of the professors. They were great. I liked it. But I can tell you the guy I sat next to for three weeks who ran the biggest Victoria's Secret of New Zealand and Australia. And he had 6,000 employees and like seven CEOs that reported directly to him because he was the executive chairman. I learned more from sitting next to that guy during those three weeks than I learned from the professors. What's the point? You ain't going to school because of professors. You're going to school because you're recruiting the next great revolutionary leaders that are going to do something together. And you guys can all come together. Okay. So maybe a last name. This family is going to come with the right last name. That family is going to come with this last name. This family is going to come with this lineage. And then you guys can kind of work together. That's all I'm thinking about when you go there. Uh, and that, that value to me is above everything else. That's the only reason where if they're saying they're going to go, great. I think you got to go take advantage of that. That makes perfect sense. It's the age old saying of it's who you know, not what you know. Yeah, uh, Chris, I, I will hand it back to you. I, I cut you off a little bit, but I, I wanted to, I was curious to know your thoughts on the education system. Yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so I guess tying it back to those five questions. So you got to drink from the fire hose as we speak, listening to Michael Saylor. And he's truly a, a genius in the way he speaks. And um, he's brilliant as much as he is good at speaking. I know uh, I'm an engineer by degree, and I have many people that are very brilliant, but they were not able to easily express their ideas where Michael Saylor is kind of the combination of the two. Uh, so tying that back into Bitcoin, and as you said in your own title, the patron saint of Bitcoin, Michael Saylor, um, I guess, how do you th see Bitcoin uh, interrupting all of those five most powerful people or just interrupting the way that we have right now? Well, let's, let's go through it. Okay, so virtual government. If anybody, right, and I know there's a lot on Twitch. I know some of these guys that are trying to do BitCloud. I know some guys are trying to create social media tied to crypto or Bitcoin, all of that. When that takes place, and somebody comes out with a YouTube that's got the blockchain technology or the Facebook or the Twitter, whoever it is, Jack Dorsey left Twitter and the new CEO some people like, a lot of people don't like because he took it to a completely different route. Now, he did create a couple of things that you got to give him credit for. Hey, upgrade your Twitter account for $2.99. You can upload 10-minute videos instead of 2-minute and 20-second videos. He's doing some stuff, but some of the people are being silenced that maybe they weren't before. So people are starting to sit there and say, maybe Jack Dorsey wasn't as bad as I thought he was. Maybe it was the board that was pushing for certain things and he was kind of outnumbered. He couldn't do anything. We don't know yet. We're going to find out what Jack's going to be doing. But I think if, if, the, so, if the virtual governments get a competition that's immediately tied to cryptocurrency, it's game over. Let me say that one more time. If a Elon Musk, and I've been saying this from the day that they were trying to cancel Joe Rogan, and I said, if Spotify cancels Joe Rogan, the first person that's going to call Joe Rogan is going to be Elon Musk. And he's going to say, let's sign, I'll sign a 20-year contract with you, 50 million a year. You're going to be a content creator for the social media side I'm creating. Let's go recruit everybody. And they add blockchain to it. That's going to scare the crap out of the U.S. government. That's going to scare the crap out of regulators. That's going to scare the crap out of, you know, the Federal Reserve guys. That's going to scare the crap out of a lot of people. Because remember, virtual government is the most powerful out of the five institutions and individuals that we discussed, right? So I think that's that part, that they got to play offense there. Um, I think a Michael Saylor who's going out there talking and teaching, he's doing the right job doing that. And he needs to do more of it. I think him, Pompliano, there, there's a bunch of these guys that are going out there that are great educators. I think, I think Anthony is a great, phenomenal teacher. 
in his own way when he's teaching these concepts. And there's some other guys out there as well. But you have to realize, okay, so president of the United States, what does that mean? Kind of need to put a list of 40 people that we think maybe can run for office one day who are extremely pro-crypto, who are not just, hey, I'm such and such and I'm pro-crypto. No, 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 no. I'm talking like, you know, no, no. Because if a pro-crypto person like a Michael Saylor gets into your office and he has that kind of influence, do you know who's going to fight against people like him getting elected? All the major banks, all the major institutions, all the, they're, they're going to be shivering. So you need a list of 40 candidates like that, that you're building, stars, okay? And your plan's got to be a 5, 10, 15, 20-year plan. It ain't going to happen next two years. It's got to be a 5, 10, 15, 20-year plan. And you get that bench deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, where it's not just conversations, just about crypto. That'd be one. Two is more guys getting on mainstream media to educate those guys. So you need people from both sides of the aisle politically that are pro crypto, pro Bitcoin to go out there and talk about it. They need to get more billionaires. They're getting them guys like Michael Saylor out there. You saw another one that bought, I don't know, $192 million of Bitcoin. I don't know what the exact number was. And they keep doing it every day to the point where they may run out of things being for sale because the bigger guys are getting into it. And then eventually you got the social side and the education side. If crypto creates their own universities, and they go through the education. Again, like I'm saying, education is wide open for disruption. But you know, no matter how much people create hate for the crypto community, that audience keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. I've said this, it's becoming a very big political party. If the crypto community was a political party, it'd be the fastest growing political party in America. If cryptocurrency was considered a political party, and they don't like to say that because, oh, I'm not, I'm a libertarian. I'm not. If you were a political party, you're the fastest growing political party in America, and the opposition has to start to realize that your vote matters a lot. So it's just a matter of time where that voice gets bigger. Now, meanwhile, it doesn't mean Elizabeth Warren is going away. It doesn't mean politicians aren't going to try to get in the way. It doesn't mean manipulators aren't going to try to make you look bad and ugly, ugly and link every horror story, whatever they do to you. That's going to continue happening. And that's my biggest fear. But I think eventually the innovators, you know, historically have always prevailed. Yeah. And I think those are really good points. Um, I know of the five things that we listed, would you consider, so the, now we take the five that you have, the list of starting at the virtual governments being the most powerful, does the Federal Reserve, are they more powerful than them? Because the money starts there in theory, like they're the ones behind the money printers, as we joke in the Bitcoin community. Oh, you mean if you, if you were to put them on the list here? No, yeah, I don't. So you, yeah. You, I don't put them around, I don't put them uh, ahead of, uh, the only person I would put them ahead of would be billionaires. I'd put them at number three. Interesting. So you don't think they're more powerful than the federal government or than the virtual governments virtual. and education institutions? No way. The, here's why. Hmm. Because, because they're controllers, right? They controllers. They're, they control the market with one announcement or two announcements, Federal Reserve, right? They're controllers. But Federal Reserve doesn't influence. They're not influencers. Virtual government are influencers. Universities are influencers. Those guys are playing the control game. They're very important. I'm not going to sit here and tell you they're not important. Of course they are. They're very important. But if you control all the virtual governments today and you started making videos about Federal Reserve and telling everybody what's really going on and you didn't get censored, I mean, eventually people are going to have to quit. People are going to have to change models. People are going to have to be answering tough questions. They're just not being forced to answer those questions today. If the educational system really started teaching what the Federal Reserve is all about, you think things would change? But they're not doing that because they can't, because God forbid if they do. So yes, I think the influencers are still at the top with you know the virtual governments and the educational system. But Federal Reserve is going to be third place. They'll be above billionaires because they can ruin billionaires' lives if they wanted to. I agree to it to an extent with what you're saying. I agree that while educational institutions and the virtual uh, government system that we have in place, they have the control, but the incentive structure that we live under, we are all incentivized at the end of the day by dollars. They, the universities maintain their control and power based on how much dollars they bring in and how, how much product they're able to turn out. No different than Twitter and all of these other platforms, they're incentivized by the dollar. 
if the Federal Reserve is the one controlling the dollar, they essentially control the incentive structure that the entire world operates, no? I, I get that, but I'll tell you this. Let me ask you, does it help? Okay, so what's the dumbest thing Federal Reserve can continue to do? Print more money right now. Okay, does that, does that help or hurt cryptocurrency community? helps us okay so who gives a shit so, so, <laughs> you know what i'm saying what i'm what i'm trying to say is, what i'm trying to say is even the dumbest thing they could do which is to constantly print it only helps you so what's the opposite of the dumbest thing they could do not print you think they're gonna not print no so they're going to kill themselves you're gonna see how they're going to kill themselves this doesn't last forever for you to keep doing something like this the more you do the more you increase the valuation of the people that bought Ethereum, that bought Bitcoin, that bought, you know, gold base, anything that's non-duplicatable assets going to increase in value every single time these guys print money. No, I, I think that's really great. So um, where was I going to go with this? So if we're looking at the basis of money then, so to, speaking of Bitcoin, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on this Q. If, if you want to take over, have a question. I, I, have, I have a question that's a little bit more technical. Um, I don't know how much you actually are paying attention or following like the rate hikes that the Fed does, for example, based on what the market said off of the, the yield curves, it had already forecasted a 25 basis point hike and said essentially one and a half percent for the whole year, i.e. 25 for all six of the terms, all six opportunities they have, they will increase. If the market just was able to operate as such, so the market says, hey, we expect or we want a 25 basis point hike right now, and we just eliminate the Federal Reserve, i.e. introducing real free market capitalism, and allow that to dictate what our uh, interest rates look like, what effect does that have on an individual going to a bank versus an individual buy, uh, to like get a loan for their new business? I mean, you know, do you believe in unicorns? Do, do, do you believe, you know, you know what I mean? So the last guy that tried to eliminate Federal Reserve, you know what happened to him? November 22nd, I think 1963 or 64. Do you remember what happened to this man? He was assassinated. Yeah. Do you know what happened to him? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. we all know I what happened. Stop. I, so you're saying I should stop saying this no, consistently I'm not, on the show. I'm not, I'm not saying, I think you should keep saying things. I'm saying for a person that can really make that change to go into office, if he goes after Federal Reserve, studies show that people disappear. Okay, John F. Kennedy was going in a different direction and they were not happy. I'm not telling you that's the reasoning or not, but things changed very quickly right after he died and he was pulling out of war. Immediately, we went back into war and they were both Democratic presidents. So it's not like it was a Republican took over. Democrat, Democrat, Lyndon Johnson. So, and, and, you know, there's a lot of people that don't want that to happen, but just keep this part of mind. Keep printing. The only people they hurt every time they print, believe it or not, is the people that they claim they're trying to help the most. The only people they hurt every time they print are the people that they claim they're trying to help, which is low and middle income families. A billionaire sits there and says, print some more, please. Every time you print, I'm automatically getting richer. Every time you print. If I'm worth 2 billion, you print 20% of US currency that you've ever printed, I'm officially worth 2.4 billion. Thank you. But if I have $20,000 in a bank and you print it 20% and I'm middle income or low income family, that 20,000 is not $16,000. I can't afford that. So they're going to eventually, they're going to eventually lose their true believers, which is a low and middle income families. And when that community that you've had to vote for in your entire life, you lose them, you're screwed. So a lot of those guys are starting to become a little bit more sophisticated. You know, like one of the things that cryptocurrency did is it forced you to be a little bit more sophisticated. Not everybody is as sophisticated as Michael Saylor. There may only be one Michael Saylor in the world, by the way, when it comes down to these types of things. But if you were a two in the area of sophistication, you want to learn about crypto, you became a four, you know. If you were a four, you became a five and a half. If you were a five, you became a six and a quarter. But we all got a little bit more sophisticated because we're like, let me see what this is all about. And what's this? And what's blockchain? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, okay, cool. Now I'm learning a little bit more. Well, the more people learn, the more they see that Federal Reserve is not a good thing. 
So the only thing the crypto community needs to do more is you just need to baptize more people. That's what you need to do. These Miami events that you guys have, these Mayor Suarez, these people that are going around, you know, screaming off the top of their lungs, you just need to do more of it and more of it and more of it and more of it. And then all of a sudden, tipping point, it's too late. They can't do nothing about it. So you guys are in the baptizing business today. You, you, you guys, the, 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 the Billy Grahams of crypto are coming out. The people that are going on crusades and they're like, we're going to convert 200 million people the next 10 years. Awesome. Those are the guys that are going to be the most important people. And just let Federal Reserve do the same thing they keep doing. They're going to keep doing what they're doing. You just sit there and say, okay, cool. No problem. No problem. No problem. When an enemy is about to fall, you just get out of their way. They're they're killing themselves. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I think that ties in. I finally remember what I wanted to ask. Um, so I guess it, we've seen a breakdown of trust. We could say even it started the last 20 years. We could say it's the last 50 years. I know there's debates about when it started. I could definitely say in the last two years, many people distrust uh, a lot of things. You know, I'd hate to say their own neighbors, but you know, mainstream media, doctors, lawyers, whatever it may be, trust is kind of eroding rapidly. Um, and I know a big thing in the Bitcoin community is don't trust, verify. So even people have lost distrust of big tech and the virtual governments that we speak of. While we still distrust them, many of us still use it. We're using Zoom here. We're on YouTube, whatever you call it. So how do you see Bitcoin being a pillar of trust or, or a network that even if a Michael Saylor goes away, if Q and I go away and we hold Bitcoin, I, I won't speak for you, Patrick, whether you hold it, but how can we see this network being uh, grown and not needing to trust one another, but able being able to operate in this system where it's trustless, but we trust it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, go back four years ago, people swore by Jan, John McAfee, right? Was, oh my God, John McAfee, you know, whatever he said, and we'll, we'll, you know, go buy, go, so don't sell, keep it. Some of you guys keep selling it. Why are you selling it? Sit them. Okay, it's gonna go to this, it's gonna go to that. You know, God bless John McAfee. I've interviewed the guy and we've had conversations together and it was very interesting interview. It's the only interview I've ever done when in the middle of the interview, a guy pulled out a gun in the middle of the interview. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Or yeah, I saw the interview. It was a wild yeah. interview. <laughs> yeah, it was a wild interview. But, uh, you know, when, when the day Magic retired, as a kid, I cried three times when something happened with like celebrities. One was Magic getting AIDS. HIV and retiring. Two was when Michael retired and three was when Tupac died. Those three events, right? Okay. Magic uh, retired. Jordan kept on for another five, for another seven years, minus the two year stint that he took away. And people pretty quickly are like, Magic was great, but man, Michael took it to a whole different level. You know, Michael, we're never going to have another Michael. Kobe shows up and Shaq shows up, dominance, boom, you know, and I'm a Kobe guy. Oh, we're never going to get another this. And then boom, next thing you know, LeBron shows up and then KD shows up and then Kyrie shows up and Steph shows up. Oh my God. So the point is the league is bigger than one player. Bitcoin is bigger than a Michael Saylor or a one big personality. It's bigger than any one of us. Uh, it's bigger than any personality. It's, it's just, that's, that's what makes it special. You know, it's not, uh, uh, it's not something that is relying on one or two or three or four or five voices to make it go. You guys got so many people right now. You just got to keep baptizing more and growing that base bigger and bigger and bigger. You need more, like you need to be praising the next superstar Bitcoin guy that comes out that's going viral. Awesome. Another one. Awesome. Another one. Awesome. Another one. It can't be the competitive side. No, no. Oh man, he's getting more views than me. No, it just got to be like, look, man, we're, we got we got a billion views last week, guys. Collectively as a group, awesome job, great. Let's keep going. Let's go to two. Let's go to three. Let's go to four. We baptized two hundred thousand people last week. Let's go to four hundred thousand. Right? It needs to be that kind of a model. The moment churches started competing with each other, that's when it was like, why am I going to church to compete? It wouldn't come. So crypto community cannot be competing against each other. If you guys stay united, the community stays united. It's gonna be a, it's gonna be a pretty wild ride. You're muted. Yep. No, sorry. Um, I want to go back a little bit now and ask you sort of how you first learned about Bitcoin and what were your initial 
reactions. There's no right or wrong answer. I, I'll admit I was very skeptical and I was like, I don't want to use this to send myself weed. Like, no, I, <laughs> I learned about it way too early on for the wrong reasons. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say, you know, for me, everything is, I'm naturally paranoid. I grew up in Iran. You know, we don't easily, you know, trust somebody like, you know, or investments or something that comes out but you're also risky. And you're like, ah, I'll put a little bit into this, see what happens here and there. When I first started learning about Bitcoin, I was in such a obsessed phase of my career that I never looked up to see what it was fully about. It's like, oh, Bitcoin, oh, Bitcoin, oh, Bitcoin. Got it. Insurance. I'm just going, 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 going. I was just like, literally, I was so obsessed. Would I have any time for it? But then, you know, you start getting, hey, Patrick, we'll give you $50,000 of Bitcoin if you want to go speak at such and such place. Oh, you want to pay me through Bitcoin? Yeah. Where do I put that? Oh, you need to open up a such and such wallet. I'm like, huh, okay, cool. So I, I got I'm, I, I got Bitcoin, I got Ethereum, I got some stuff. I don't have a lot, like I don't have, you know, $50 million of Bitcoin, but I got a little bit of Bitcoin that's, that's sitting there. Uh, and most people think I have nothing. I do have some Bitcoin, I do have some Ethereum. It's just not a, a, a big number. So it's a very small percentage of my network that I have put it in there. But my concerns always been the following. There's three different types of people every morning when they wake up, okay? There's the one guy that wakes up in the morning that is just kind of like, ah, oh, cool. What a great day. And does nothing. It's just a regular day. And he's totally okay with that. She's totally okay with that. There's another guy that wakes up in the morning that's in the hunt. It's like, oh, oh my God, I'm going to go learn. I'm going to get better. I'm going to read this. I'm going to da, 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 da but I'm going to get better and I'm going to compete in marketplace. He's the hunter. Then there's a guy that wakes up every morning that says, let me see where the hunter is going to get the leftover and to get in his way. Oh, that's where he's going. I'm going to get that leftover. Oh, do it. oh I'm going to get him to fall. Because that community is envious of the hunters. Their whole MO in life is they don't want to do the work of the hunter, but they want to get the respect, the accolades, the eyeballs that hunters get. And they're never going to get it. It's the envy community that doesn't go away. Every morning, those guys wake up and they see another Bitcoin billionaire. They lose their minds. They want to figure out a way how to take that away from them. They want to figure out a way how to tax it, how to regulate it. My concern with Bitcoin has always been that. Now, as the audience is getting bigger and bigger names are coming in and bigger names are being baptized, I mean... Now you have to kind of pay attention to it. You kind of have to be like, ooh, did you see who just got converted? Huh. Ooh, did you see what Ukraine did to Bitcoin and how? Wow. I never thought about it. That did you see the truckers, how Canada said, Ottawa, you got to do this and you can't get Bitcoin? They couldn't get in the wallet of Bitcoin, but they could get into GoFundMe credit card. <gasps> what if I have? Now people are starting to like the basic questions that they're asking. They're like, babe, let's try to get a Bitcoin, you know? And then that when, when you get those guys that are just innocently seeing the value of it, which is happening today, I mean, it's, it's just inevitable. But for me, that was the evolution that I personally went through. I wasn't one of the guys that, you know, I don't have a story to tell you. I have about 200 Bitcoins and I just sat on, oh, I'm sitting on $12 million. I don't have one of those stories. My story is a very different story. But Chris and I were joking. We're like, yeah, but your stack is still way larger than our stack. So <laughs> um, I want to highlight something because, you know, our shared homeland, or I like to say my homeland, although I was, I was born here, uh, Iran was one of the first countries to really start using Bitcoin on a more transactional basis. Um, you also see countries like Russia start to talk about Bitcoin as a possible means of taking out the petrodollar. Um, look, these aren't, these aren't friends of America, especially not right now. What effect do you think that could have if countries like Iran or Russia start to adopt Bitcoin as far as domestic policy goes? I, I don't know. I mean, look, I, I talk to people and I go, well, nobody can hack into it. Nobody can do this. Nobody can do that. Nobody can do this. Okay, great. Um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, the, 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 the way business works is sometimes we're forced to use something that we never thought we would use. I didn't get on Facebook. The first 50 times I was told to get on Facebook. Back in the days, you'd get an invitation by a friend. And I'd be like, stop sending me an invitation. I'm not joining Facebook. Yeah, but you can post a picture. 
I don't care to post a picture, bro. I'm a private guy. Yeah, but what if you get 50 likes? What do you mean? Well, what if you get 50 thumbs up? But I, I don't understand what you're saying. Like, do you understand? Like, I had no clue what that meant, right? So, yeah, but you know how you do this? There was this one website that you would go and uh, check in. And if you checked in at like seven places at the same time in the same day, you're like a bar hopper. And you got, but I got such and such badge. I don't know if you guys remember that once. I don't know yeah. what the name of it was. What was the name of it? Do you remember the name of the site? Um, it was uh, Square, Square or something? Or was uh, it, it was four, another four Square, Four Square maybe? I, I think, think it is Four Square. I don't know one of those things, right? You're like, oh my gosh, I'm a bar hopper. You know, I was like, oh, I got this so cool, man. Um, but almost every app that we're using today, we were eventually forced to use it, okay? So listen, the world's being forced to use it. They don't have a choice. It's, <laughs> and some are going to be early, some are going to be late, but you're, you're, you're going to be forced to use it. When somebody says, I'd like to make my payment to you of $17 million through Bitcoin, you're going to be like, but I don't have a wallet. You can find a very quick way to get that wallet set up to get that 17 million bucks ASAP, right? And we get guys like Elon Musk, one and a half billion dollars. You get guys like Michael Saylor, who was against it, that comes in. This guy was worth $7 billion before there were a lot of people worth $7 billion. You know, we're talking 15, 20 years ago. He made his money many different ways. I think it's just, you know, Iran, Russia, and many others are either being cornered where they have to use it, but they're also going to corner others to have to use it as well. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great point that I, I highlighted on this show. It's those countries that have had the least benefit of being allies with the US who have not benefited from this consistent money printer. They're more incentivized to find a new means, a new source of money. Um, within Bitcoin, there is still this ongoing debate of an idea of should it be a store of value? Should it be a medium of exchange? I'm curious your thoughts of where you see sort of this asset, this technology, and where it lends itself better to. Uh, store of value over or exchange. Is that kind of what you're, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, you know, are these people buying Bitcoin because they're trying to store their money somewhere? No, they're buying Bitcoin because they're thinking this thing is going to be, there's only, what's the number? 21 million by the time everything is, you know, so yeah, I mean, when there's no more, the basic, when we took high school uh, uh, economics and you learn about supply and demand, it's very, it takes 10 seconds to learn about supply and demand. You're not going to have a choice to price the value. I don't know where it's going to go. You know, I don't know what the number is today, but it, that thing is not going to stay at the price point that it's at today. You know, whatever, what is the number today? 40 some thousand, 38,000. What's the number today? 47,000, I think. Okay. 45,994, say 46,000. Okay. And Ethereum's at 3310. You know, if people keep locking up spots, this, like, look at what BlackRock did. $10 trillion company, right? Like nearly 10% of the world's money is under BlackRock, managed under BlackRock, which is pretty insane when you think about it, right? What did they do? They went and picked up all these apartment complex buildings and they bought them left and right. What are they doing? Are they being uh, noble to do that? No, they're, they're made to make money with their investors' money. What's their strategy when they're doing that? They're going to lock up and force tenants to have to pay a price point that they're paying. It's a smaller way of a monopoly is what BlackRock is doing. BlackRock doesn't have $10 trillion because they're bad at what they do. And Bitcoin doesn't have a trillion dollars because it doesn't have a good argument. And it's not attracting all these brilliant minds because those people are fools and they don't know what they're doing. So store value, yeah, probably more for governments and banks. They may look at it from that standpoint. But most individuals that are in it, it's going to be more from, I feel this thing's going to go up and I just want more of it. I want to store more of it. I think the more important thing is going to be the day that 70% of us are using a Bitcoin credit card or Ethereum credit card. And we're just going out there and saying, yeah, here you go. Boom, boom. Here you go. Boom, boom. I don't think we're there yet. Once we go there, you can easily see this thing go from 46,000 to all of a sudden 10x that number to 460 and now people are buying one tent, one 100. It's going to be a different ball game, especially with the direction we're going. But supply and demand historically has never lied. I appreciate you bringing up supply and demand. Um, we all and I'm going to say this to you and Chris. I got three more minutes because uh, they're waiting for me outside, but make this the last one. This and is the last question for you. 
Um, Ethereum has no supply cap. What value do you see in Ethereum given the fact that Bitcoin has a hard cap of 21 million? Yeah, but 50% of NFTs are being bought through Ethereum, right? Like whatever the number, it's a big number, give or take, you know? For uh, now. Yeah, for, yeah, sure, for now. Uh, and to know who the founder is, you know, it's, you know, some of it is linked to us knowing who the founder is and what if he does something. But the good thing is he's a stable guy. He seems like a very stable personality guy for the most part. Um, you know, I don't know. I don't know if there, um, some people are saying it's going to be at the same levels as Bitcoin. I don't, I'm not part of that camp, but a lot of people are saying that's possible. Uh, and we don't know yet. Things are still way too early, but they did pick up a very big account. Okay, if you think about things as accounts, NFTs is a pretty big account. And if you go on, like if you go on OpenSea and like, oh, but you can buy this NFT for 0.1 ETH or whatever, you know, it doesn't say 0.1, you know, it's BT, it says 0.1. So I don't know. I think they got a very, very important account and they're early in it. And I think that's going to help them. Is that going to continue to last as quickly as things are changing? Something better may come. I don't know. But uh, I think it, I think that part is a little too early to tell. No, I, I appreciate that, and, and I will agree with you and say that Vitalik Buterin he invent he's a founder of many things, but there's one thing in particular that he uh, really hit it out of the park on, and that was founding Bitcoin Magazine. Um, <laughs> Patrick, this conversation just flew by. This was a treat for the two of us. Where can our viewers and listeners learn more about you and stay up to date with things that you have cooking? Yeah, you can. Uh, I mean, I'm on Twitter, Patrick with David's my handle. Uh, and you can find me on YouTube. Just type my name. We got a channel called Valuetainment with a few million subscribers. And you, we, we, run, we run a podcast twice a week called PBD Podcast. And we talk about pretty much everything. Patrick, thank you so much for giving your time to us. This was a treat. Thanks, Great guys. Appreciate you. you. Great talking. Thanks, Patrick. Take care. Bye -bye, talk to bye -bye. you later. Have a good one. Everyone else, stick around through this commercial break. We will be back shortly to wrap it up because I need to go to the bathroom. <sighs> guys we're back uh we're still waiting for q to get back from his bathroom run uh but no i think that was awesome it was really cool talking to patrick bet david i hope you guys got a lot out of it just like q and i did um yeah so i guess just hammering home some last minute things so we are uh six days away from the conference i'm really excited for it as is q uh it's not too late to get your tickets you can get your tickets at b.tc forward slash conference Make sure to use the code YTMAG uh, to get your tickets to get 10% off. You can also get more money off by just using paying with Bitcoin. Um, yeah, and, and then hammer home with the schedule. So next week, Monday, Tuesday, we will not be having the live stream. We're going to be setting up the conference down in Miami Beach. We will have curated content that will come out on our YouTube channel um, that we're really looking forward to pushing as well as on Rumble. We'll be putting it up on there as well. Um, and then come Wednesday, when the uh, conference starts, we'll be streaming to all platforms, Twitter, Rumble, YouTube, Twitch. Uh, we're really looking forward to it. We will have on YouTube, the Nakamoto stage or the main stage and the mining segment. And then all other platforms, we will just have the main stage. We look forward to bringing to you all this information the following week after the conference, April 11th through the 14th or 15th. We are not going to be running Bitcoin Magazine Live. We're going to be curating content from all of the stages. 
So we'll be looking forward to bringing content and clips of all the talks that occurred and all the keynote speakers and, and speeches, as well as all the information there. Um, I'll kick it back over to Q. Anything else that I missed or you're looking forward to? Um, smash that subscribe button, guys. We, we have an internal bet going and I really thought we were going to hit 69K followers or subscribers before the end of today's episode. So I just lost a bet, but like would really appreciate it if at least before we get to the conference, we hit that number because then the bet doubles and then I really lose and that's just not fun. Um, I'm hyped. Use code YTMAG, get 10% off. Feel free to hop over to the Bitcoin Magazine store. Use the same code for 21% off of any of the swag we got going over there. Um, you know, make sure you give both Chris and I a follow over on Twitter. Chris is Chris Alamo, A I M O six, at, and then uh, I am Q underscore like the letter, all one word. Yes, you literally have to type out like the letter. Um, guys, it's been fun. It's been real. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Use code YTMAG to get 10% off because otherwise, Chris and I will not be coming back after the conference. Um, they're literally tying our jobs to how many tickets we sell. And given our subscriber numbers, it has not looked good. <laughs> um, other than that, though, I hope you guys have enjoyed what we've brought to you. And next week, it's going to be bigger and better. Excited to see those of you who will be joining us down in Miami. Please make sure you come and say what's up. If we're not working and I am not at the conference grounds, I will uh, Outside of the conference. Literally, outside of the conference venue. Outside of the conference venue, starting at like 5, 45, 6 p.m., 630 Q um, you're working the whole time. <laughs> no, no, I'm up starting at like 4 a.m. My internal clock time. This is going to be tough. You think you thought I said some ridiculous stuff when I had like a full night's sleep. Just you wait, just you wait until I get up on a stage and I have no sleep. Um, yeah, I think that's a wrap. We, you know what we didn't do? We didn't do it yesterday either. Let's do a quick uh, stack some st stack some sats. Now I pulled all my sats off exchanges, dude. We're going down into to into the oh, mouth was, of the uh, wolf. So uh, you know, I, I don't I want do anything on my phone. I was doing that tomorrow, but fine. I will stack some sats right now, live on air. Feel free to join me. Use Strike if you're not using Strike. Send me a DM, and I'll give you my code so you can get ten ten dollars of free Bitcoin. Um, but yeah, smash by another five dollars right now. Hope you guys do the same. Stay humble and stack sats, fam. We'll see you on the other side of the conference.